Are we live? I think we're on. <laughs> hey, Lauren. Hi, Beauty. How are you? I'm great. Um, you're in Stockholm. I'm in Stockholm. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I know you live in Gainesville, but I think as many times as we've Zoomed, I've actually only ever seen you in like Italy and <laughs> various places in the world. <laughs> it's, it's very funny. It's true, but that's not really my life. But yeah, it's just been the times that we've Zoomed. I mean, not, not a bad uh, not a bad situation. Well, welcome everyone to Barnes and Noble's September Book Club event. Um, the September Book Club pick for Barnes and Noble is Lauren Groff's amazing new novel, Matrix. Um, such a fan, Lauren. So uh, I just want to go over a little bit about how we're going to roll uh, today and then uh, we'll get started. So I'd like to begin by introducing Lauren and asking Lauren to read a little bit, maybe five minutes or so, if that's okay with you. Sure. Yeah. And then um, we'll chat for 15, 20 minutes or so. And then I'd like to just open it up to audience questions. We have an incredible amount of questions that uh, people have mailed in in advance and just some really interesting things that I wanna get to, to, to discuss with you. So, but first, uh, uh, Lauren doesn't need much of an introduction for most of us. Um, she is, you know, in my opinion, one of our greatest living writers. Um, but just briefly, a little background. Uh, Lauren is the author of six books of fiction, uh, the most recent one being Matrix, which by the way, is now a finalist for the National Book Award, three-time finalist now Lauren has been. Um, I don't wanna jinx it, but let's just say, I think third time's a charm. Uh, her work has won the Story Prize, the American Bookseller Association, Indies Choice Award, and France's uh, Grand Prix de l'Héroïne, uh, Madame Figaro, I believe, which is a huge honor. Um, three times a finalist for the National Book Award, twice a finalist for the Kirkus Prize. She's been shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Prize, the Southern Book Prize, and the Los Angeles Times Prize. She's received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, and from Civitelli Ranieri, which I believe is where I saw you last time in your castle. Um, she was named one of Granta's best young American novelists. Uh, to date, her work has been translated into over 30 languages, and she lives in Gainesville, Florida. So I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here with you, Lauren. Um, would you kick us off? Yes, but I also want to say I'm here with one of my favorite living American writers, um, Jamie Quattro, who is brilliant and wonderful. And I have to say, without you and your voice, when it comes to this book, this book would not be what it is. So I, I like, I relied on your your genius. So thank you so much for everything you've done. And I just wanted to publicly say that because Jamie is the most generous reader on the planet. Um, so hi, yes. Thank you. <laughs> now, did you ask me a question? Because I just really, really wanted to talk about you. Yeah, no, I, that's what I asked you to do is give us a little taste of Matrix. Oh, the reading, that's right. Okay, so I just did a little event in Stockholm in the Couture House. Um, and so I, I had to bring this because I didn't have room in my luggage for my own book. Um, okay, this is just a little bit. I'm just reading just about a page and a half. She rides out of the forest alone, 17 years old in the cold marsh drizzle, Marie, who comes from France. It is 1158 and the world bears the weariness of late Lent. Soon it will be Easter, which arrives early this year. In the fields, the seeds uncurl in the dark, cold soil, ready to punch into the freer air. She sees for the first time the abbey, pale and aloof on a rise in this damp valley, the clouds drawn up from the ocean and wrung against the hills in constant rainfall. Most of the year, this place is emerald and sapphire, bursting under dampness, thick with sheep and chaffinches and newts, delicate mushrooms poking from the rich soil, but now in late winter, all is gray and full of shadows. Her old war horse glumly plods along in a Merlin shivers in its wicker mew on the box mounted behind her. The wind hushes, the trees cease stirring. Marie feels that the whole countryside is watching her move through it. She is tall, a giantess of a maiden, and her elbows and knees stick out ungainly. The fine rain gathers until it runs in rivulets down her sealskin cloak and darkens her green headcloths to black. 
Her stark Angevin face holds no beauty, only canniness and passion yet unchecked. It is wet with rain, not tears. She has yet to cry for having been thrown to the dogs. Good enough? Beautiful. I, okay, that's good. <laughs> the entire time, I'd be happy. Um, so that is such an evocative opening. I mean, you drop us immediately into the 12th century. Um, I have to say, when I first heard that you were writing this book, I think we were writing vote forward letters together via Zoom. Mm -hmm. And somehow we got into a conversation uh, about nuns as as one does when deciding <laughs> 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 letters to Democratic voters uh, in swing states. But somehow we got on the topic and you mentioned that you were writing this, this book about uh, medieval nuns and visionary kind of uh, events. And I remember my heart started going, I have to read this, I have to read this. <laughs> So um, could you just tell me a little bit about how you came to, let's maybe just talk about the genesis of the novel, how you came to this uh, subject matter um, and Marie, specifically Marie de France. Yeah, there were about four different streams that went into making this book. And the first and the oldest one is my absolute love of the, the first female poet in the French language uh, that we know of. Her name is Marie de France. And so, my Marie is Marie de France because she writes the same books, but we don't know much about her. And I and I first learned about her in um, in college. Actually, I was a French literature and English literature dual major and sort of battled it out. And for a while, I was studying ancien français and I was doing a lot of uh, translations. And I fell in love with her doing a translation. And so I carried her around for twenty years. And then. Uh, another thing that happened was I was at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard, and this, this amazing thing where you, um, they bring in uh, academics of all different stripes, you know, they're astrophysicists sitting next to chemists, sitting next to sculptors and video artists, and it's this wild mix of intellect and idea, and um, I... I go to all the lectures because I'm such a nerd and I'm like sitting there taking notes on everything. And for a hot minute, I thought I was going to write like a black hole novel <laughs> because I was so excited about what the astrophysicists um, were telling me. Um, but I went to this one lecture by my friend, Dr. Katie Bugis, who is at uh, the University of Notre Dame now, now. And what she does is she looks at the uh, liturgical manuscripts. So the, the manuscripts that the nuns used in their, their holy devotions. And she and what she does is she is able to find a sort of ways into their lives through these manuscripts. And it was so brilliant. It just sort of blew my mind. It was so good. And so as I was sitting there, my long love of Marie de France met with my absolute um, adoration of my friend giving the speech and sort of combined. And then something that I just like, I, I, I realized only recently that also went into it was just the night before I I'd, I'd watched on a plane, The Women, the, the 1939 film by George Cukor, who also uh, wrote the Philadelphia story. And it's an amazing movie. Every character is a woman, but uh, because it's from 1939, all of the conversations are about men. And I was like, you had this little, like you had to jump this high to pass the Bechdel test and you did not do it. <laughs> so it was like, that was sort of seated uh, the matrix. And so as I was sitting in the audience, I had been working on another book entirely and matrix sort of came up in front of me so large and, and the book I had to write at this moment. So I put the other one aside and just sort of devoted my life to, to this book. Wow. That's a fascinating those sort of like disparate things in your life that you've carried around or that you've been interested in and then this like sort of fusion nuclear like <laughs> explosion that happened that's amazing yeah. um so you so historical fiction and you know you've said that we're very much creatures of our time and creatures of our place and that matrix while set in the 12th century is also about our time the 21st century and that you wanted to, in writing this book, uh, address current issues as well. Can you talk about some of those uh, issues or some of those uh, themes that you were interested in exploring through the 12th century? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that um, part of this was too, that I, 
I really did not feel equipped at the time to write about the events of the 21st century. It felt, it, you know, th this book came to me in very, very early 2019. And it just felt at the time that um, events were happening faster and faster and they were sort of smashing on my head and I didn't have enough time to breathe. It comes, I, I, I once survived a riptide and it felt very similar to this, where you're you're just trying to get a breath, but the waves are just coming and coming. And so the mod modern life felt just overwhelming. But I also feel at the same time that uh, the artist has a moral duty to address the urgencies of the moment. I think that it's a profound ethical question. Uh, and we do it whatever way we can, right? And so I was trying to, I was struggling. I was really tr trying to see how I could do this, but also tell an interesting story. And so I realized that uh, historical fiction is not just escapism, or I think it probably shouldn't just be escapism. Um, it should probably speak back into our current moments. And so some of the things that I was thinking about, you know, this, this had been um, three years into, um, the Trump presidency, and I was wondering about female power, what it could have looked like, um, you know, because Hillary did not win. Um, I was I was thinking about, you know, what some of the pitfalls in female power could be, some of the, the richnesses. I was thinking about um, how to go back to the roots of how we got to where we are now in terms of climate change. And, uh, and, I, and I do situate a lot of that in our ideas at the, at the time about, um, for instance, the Crusades, right? Which is a time when all of Europe banded together in order to go down to Jerusalem and just like slay a lot of people and impose Christianity on this place. Um, and so, I think that um, the ideas of dominance versus domination um, or dominion versus domination are, are coming back up. And, and these are recurrent questions that people in the past and the people now are, are actually sort of struggling with at the same time. I mean, you can see the root of all of them extending through time and coming up. So there were a lot of issues of the day that I wanted to look at sort of slant. Mm -hmm. It was one of the things I remember when I was when I was reading the book the first time that I was so astonished by and actually it was so subtle that I didn't notice it was the complete erasure of men in this <laughs> book. And you're writing about Catholicism and Catholic hierarchy and successfully, you know, kind of leaving them out the way that 12th century literature would have left women out um, mm -hmm. and kind of inverting that. And I wondered how the religious aspects, I know you and I were, were both raised in patriarchal religious communities. Mm -hmm. So how did your own religious upbringing or your own religious sensibility uh, inform the research and the writing? And were you worried about offending, you know, these centuries and centuries of <laughs> Catholic? <laughs> I, know you, I know you were in conversation with, with friends of yours who were nuns and things, yeah. but maybe you yeah. can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think whenever you you address in your work groups of people to whom you don't belong, there's always that risk of offending, right? And I think that that's, that's a very real risk and it's something that I really should have paid attention to and did, right? So um, so I was really, really worried about it. And you're right, I, we both come from strongly patriarchal uh, Christian backgrounds. I, uh, I think um, I... I didn't realize the extent to which I um, I desired and needed this very strong vision of a God, right? Until I supplanted it, this vision with with literature in a certain way, um, and then I and then I could see sort of as a child how hungry I was for um, solidity, for certainty above the certainty of my own parents, which, you know, they, they themselves seemed very certain, but I still knew that they were fallible and mortal and to have an extra layer beyond to love you um, was so necessary to who I was, to who I was, but also um, just, you know, the, uh, religion has always been a very um, bodily, very sensory thing for me. Um, I remember being in love with my Bible 
I mean, I don't know, you probably were too, but it was this the object that smelled so good. And the, the pages were like onion skin, so they're super fine and they were super soft. And then um, there was gilt all around the corners and like that was really, really beautiful too. And so just having this object and then opening it up and finding these stories. And you and I are, like, are in love with stories, right? And having the story of like, um, I don't know, lots or Job, right? And and having these uh, like, or sex, like there's a lot of sex in the Bible um, and, and being a kid and like having these come into you all the time. I mean, that was really like a very, very beautiful thing. So um, I knew that because I have become secular in, in my life over the course of my life. And I have turned to the humanism of literature that I needed to be super sensitive to not only current day Catholicism, but also the differences between the, the Catholicism of the current day and the Catholicism of the past, because they're vastly different. Um, there are a lot of things that are shared, of course, but for instance, in the 12th century, there were no such things as rosaries. They did not exist yet. They didn't exist until the middle of the 13th century um, or 14th century, actually, I think. Um, so, so in my first draft, as, as faithful as I was to the archive, I didn't know that. And so a rosary played a really large part of, of this, um, this text. So I think um, eventually, you know, I had many friends read it, but I also, I also met um, and like became good friends with uh, these wonderful nuns. And because I understood these particular nuns and, or at least what they let me understand, um, I knew that they were profoundly sophisticated human beings, right? Really wildly smart. A lot, of, most of them have PhDs, these, the nuns that I'm talking about. They're um, really deep. They understand the contradictions. They understand doubt, they understand faith. And so I knew that even if I got some things wrong, they understood the purpose of fiction and that it wasn't necessarily to replicate exactly the way that life is, right? Like, so, so knowing that the readers that I cared about very deeply, these particular really sophisticated Catholic nuns would take this work of fiction as a work of fiction and understand what the parameters of that, that was really, really important to me, yeah. Um, you mentioned the sexuality throughout the Bible mm -hmm. and I want to say that Matrix, you, you wouldn't think that a, a novel set in the 12th century that has only female characters in this, you know, very cloistered environment could be such an explosive <laughs> sexual novel. <laughs> it's kind of like the Bible, right? Like you don't, you don't think it's going to be that way. And then you actually read it and you're like, oh my God, this whoa. is so yeah. whoa. Um, can you speak a little bit about how, you know, writing the sexuality into this particular novel, like how that was for you um, and how the relationships between the nuns kind of evolved throughout the book as you were drafting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it, the, the sexuality comes very deeply out of the character of Murray. And I had always seen Murray as just sort of larger than her own very large body, right? She's like, she's like bursting out of the world itself. She's really powerful, very strong. And she's, she's, um, she's in touch with her animal nature, which by which I mean, uh, we're all animals, obviously, right? We're all, uh, I think the job of civilization has been historically and possibly not to our benefit to to make us forget that we're novel we're animals and but we are and so we take in information through our bodies and um we feel emotionally in our bodies very very deeply and marie is very much an animal more so than i think most people <laughs> alive so her hungers are big and her lusts are enormous and her her ambitions are manifest through the body so um so of course she's gonna feel sex sex sexual feelings throughout the the book um a lot of them she can't uh, satiate but some of them she can 
And of course this, you know, I was, you know, I was really feeling very tender about this when it came to a lot of the Catholics that I met too. But I also was sort of, I, I did a lot of research into the historical record and the, the, see a pregnant nun in the Middle Ages was not all that uh, that strange, right? This is something that happened a lot. Um, or, you know, and it was a scandal, it was bad, uh, but it happened. Or um, there was a whole amazing book about uh, like what they would have called female sodomy, which is, you know, women with women. And um, it, it did not happen, right? People were gay back then too, right? And people had sex all the time throughout history, so. <laughs> That's fascinating. I, I didn't know that about the pregnancy was not uncommon. Uh, well, it's not, it wasn't uncommon, but it, uh, it happens for right. sure. Yeah. Um, that's, that's fascinating. I have a couple more things I want to ask you about, and I do want to leave time uh, for the Q and A, but something, something I noticed. So, so in Matrix, part of the plot revolves around the construction of this labyrinth. And it's this sort of protective architectural uh, endeavor that the nuns team up to build to hide the abbey from men to protect themselves. And it reminded me of Fates and Furies. Has anyone ever pointed this out to you when at the very beginning when Lotto is on the beach and he constructs the spiral in the sand? Um, so I was just gonna read that section and what uh, Lotto <laughs> says that represents. And then I wanna ask you about these structures and novel structures and its connection to time. So, so on, yeah, in Fates and Furies, and I know most of us have read it, uh, Lotto, the, the husband, is on the beach with friends and they're building this elaborate spiral, um, I guess, digging into the sand, putting the lifeguard tower at its center. One by one, they guessed aloud about what Lotto had meant by this sculpture. Nautilus, fiddlehead, galaxy thread running off its spindle, forces of nature, perfect in beauty, perfectly ephemeral, they guessed. He was too shy to say, time. And you do wonders with time in all of your books with compression and expansion, but particularly in Matrix, you've got so much time compressed. So could you talk a little bit about these spiral structures and then the structure of novels and how that relates perhaps to your, the conception of time and you're not in the novel? I love that you are the only human who has ever asked me this. And this is the only time this, I, I, I like, this is why I love speaking to you. Well, I mean, one of the like a hundred million reasons. Um, so yes, uh, in, in that book, I mean, spirals are, are throughout all of my work. They just they recur over and over and over again. Part of it is um, I have had on the wall for many years um, a, a a picture of the Cathedrale de Chartres, um, like the the Unicursal Labyrinth, is sort of set into the stone there. And so, labyrinth spiral structure, sort of the Fibonacci sort of like structure, the the gold mean, all that um, that comes back over and over again in my thinking because I I'm actually seeing it visibly when I'm actually working a lot. In um, I in this particular book. I didn't have an actual structure until I remembered the labyrinth or the unicursal labyrinth, which is the one way through labyrinth. And then I remembered, oh my God, right? Time, this is, this is what time is, particularly in the life of Marie. And so that became the actual physical architectural structure of the book is, is a labyrinth, as well as sort of a motif in, in terms of plot too. It's something, right, that, that Marie builds in order to keep the abbey and islands of women. So, um, right, if you think about it, right, there's life, uh, and throughout this book too, um, I've patterned in, in such a way so that you sort of see things from different parts, the way that you follow through a Unicoastal Labyrinth, and you feel like you're going back to the, the beginning, but you're really just like a, a one step over. And then you, there's only one way through it. There's only one way through life um, it, when you're a human being and you get to the center and you don't get out basically. And so I, I built this book around the, the shape and the patterning of a labyrinth. And I, you are the only person who's been able to like actually see the, the structural element of that. That's, um, that makes me so happy. Thank you. Well, 
I did read it twice or three times. No, <laughs> <laughs> maybe four. Yeah. I, I, confession: I, I did read it in manuscript. I, um, you and I have talked a lot about structure in the novel because yeah. you have graciously read stuff for me too. And so structure, like you're the goddess of structure. So I, I had to assume that that was a very intentional spiraling. And, and what I love, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions, is that Marie is this capacious, expanding human, right? She's swallowing up the Catholic hierarchy into her body. And yet, so that's like the outward spiral. And yet inside of herself, she is becoming enclosed and enclosed until at the end, she's like encased in this, seeing herself as a slave encased in a box. And I think that brilliant evocation of that spiral moving in both directions, um, I, I couldn't help but notice it. So I'm, I'm glad it was something that was intentional. Um, oh, I love you. I love that you're here talking to me now. This is so lovely. Thank you. We'll do, we'll do more of it soon, I hope. Um, yes. Okay, I want to open or turn kind of, there's a lot of questions coming in in the Q&A, uh, but also readers, uh, Barnes and Noble book club readers sent in their questions in advance. So I'm going to jump in with, um, let's see, one that you haven't talked about much. I loved this one. Donalyn Shaw wrote, which nun makes you smile when you think about her? Okay. I love Githa. I think Githa, Githa's the one with the blue teeth. And um, that actually came from Katie Bogus's talk because she showed us that um, ar archaeologists have dug up the jawbone and the, and the teeth of these, I think, 12th century nuns in Germany. And there was lapis lazuli embedded in the dental um, structure. And um, that goes to show, and this was what was so exciting about it, that goes to show that the nun was uh, either eating lapis lazuli, although why would she be doing that? Or she was licking um, the paintbrush and so was engaged in doing illuminations, which up to that point had been um, a hypothesis and only something that men would have done. And to have that suddenly become a possible in the realm of women was like so incredible. But also Githa is mad. She's actually wildly mad. Um, and I, uh, the other thing that that came from my very brief exposure to an abbey is that it's a place that um, takes in people and loves them no matter what, right? It loves them just, you know, sometimes despite themselves in terms of web well, right? But, uh, but also loves them until they die. And I think that um, in comparison to the way that we treat people nowadays, who uh, are not, are, who are neurodivergent, right? Um, I think that that is possibly the, the, the love of an Abbey is just like much kinder, much gentler than, than the way that we treat people now. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And we're getting a lot of chime in that people also love Nest. So. I love Nest, I love Nest. Nest Thank is you. great, yeah. Um, okay, we'll go to a live question from Carlos Zayas Pons, who says, I was absolutely enthralled with the tension you introduce in the latter half of Matrix regarding the legitimacy of Marie's visions, whether or not, that, whether they're politically motivated or truly divine inspiration, um, or why not both? How did you balance the awe and the beauty of the visions with a nagging, possibly undercutting sense they might be lies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tried not to open the suggestion until what happens at the end with Tilda and her panic in the fire, right? So I think, um, but the other thing too that was that what struck me in, in researching all of these incredible medieval mystics who are my favorite humans who have ever lived, <laughs> right? Like, I, I love Hildegard von Bingen with all of my soul. She's the greatest. Um, and for those of you who don't know her, she was a musician and we still play her music now. I mean, she, she's just a profound innovator in music. She was a, um, a medical person. Uh, she, she wrote this text that is, uh, has been read for 400 years after her death. I mean, it was like, it was the text. Uh, but she was also a visionary and after her menstruation stopped. The, the, when her bodily fertility was gone, she started getting these incredible visions from God. And what she did was 
she used these visions as a way, I mean, these are real. And I actually believe that they very much have come from God, but she also was very, very canon, canny in the way that she used them. And she used them to, to create space for herself in a very oppressive male dominated world. Right. So she was able to, to become the person that popes and kings wrote to for advice. And she um, was able to get money to, to build her abbey for her women. And she was able to do all sorts of things that otherwise she might not have been able to do if she hadn't been given these, these visions. So the visions are not only like a gift, right? But they're also power. And she was able to translate that power into worldly power. And I think that that tension really fed into this this um, idea of Marie possibly having very legitimate visions. Uh, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. And um, did it actually matter? Because the end result was that she was able to take care of her, her nuns. Um, there are so many questions coming in, but a lot of questions about one thing, which is I want to know how much of what Marie in the book, it, how much is real and how much did you make up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. A little bit to the, to that. How much so we don't know anything about her really. We have only suppositions, right? The real actual person. So these are the suppositions that we have that she may have been an abbess of barking, which is an abbey. She may have been one of the daughters of Eleanor of Aquitaine from her first marriage to Louis Set. Um, she may have been uh, an illegitimate noble. These are all just the suppositions. A lot of them uh, contravene each other. Um, so we don't actually know much about her actually, uh, but we do know her work. So we know the lay, the, these, these amazing fantastical poems that have like enchanted ships and like talking stags and like lovers who die on mountaintops. So, like it's the most amazing um, book. And we have our fables and we may have a third book, uh, the, the Life of a Saint, but not everybody is a, agrees that they're hers. So um, all I was able to do basically is go back to the text that she actually wrote, pull out vivid images and ideas and, and then sort of build on that very, flimsy carapace uh, a, a biography. And so her bio, bio, biography of the woman in the book um, is invented out of the images of the work of the actual human. And that's the only thing I could have done. Okay. It's fascinating because, you, you know, as you read it, you think there must have been so much research into the life of Marie de France to, to have created this character and, and really, could you speak just a tiny bit to the amount of research you did have to do into the into mm -hmm. the 12th century? And Anna, um, was it Anna Tretsky asked? No, Stacy Schroeder asked, what materials and resources did you find the most helpful? Yeah, so I did, a, I did do a great deal of research. Um, I think that uh, the thing that was most mind boggling to me was sort of the daily lives of what the nuns would have experienced in, a, in an abbey um, because there were so many periods of prayer. Each period of prayer had its own rules um, and there were cyclical rules too. So you had to understand what was happening throughout the year as well. And then add on to that, sort of the things that were happening in the immediate world. So like when the rye gets um, cut, you know, when it gets sown, um, the rogation days, like all of these other things that actually have to happen in the life of a farm, which is what Murray was in charge of an enormous estate of many, many farms. So she had to know when the pigs get cold, right? So I had to know all this. Um, and that was actually the hardest thing, sort of understanding the the day-to-day -day sort of granular life of a 12th century abbey and um, how to make beer, for instance, <laughs> um, or ale at the time, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, how they, how they made the bread from the beginning to the end. So like all of this I had to understand. <coughs> excuse me, I've been talking for hours now. Oh, one second. <coughs> hmm how Easter was decided on because it was decided on a different date every year. Um, so just really like the really nitty gritty stuff was the stuff that I really, really had to work through. And I 
Um, I did a lot of understanding of sort of the political, larger political worlds too, and what was going on in, in Europe in general at the time too. And so I had to track where Eleanor of Aquitaine was throughout um, Maria's life too, so to know all of these things. So uh, it was both the balancing of the the micro things, right? The, the, the things that were happening at any estate at the time and the, the macro things, the, the sort of the papal interdicts that would have affected them, um, all of the, the, the political things going on within the, the Angevin realm. Um, it, was, it was complicated. It was like, so I had like, like so many notebooks full of things, but the thing is what I wanted to do is um, write a book similar to Penelope Fitzgerald's The Blue Flower, which wears its history very lightly. And so it seems as though she knows what she's talking and she does, but it, it's not like, and then, you know, he wrote and so right? like, it's not like, like portentous. I, I really wanted to stay away from that. Um, and so the things that really helped me in, in that was just really just academic work. I, I did a, a lot of work um, looking at academic papers. And I, and I will say it's one of the things I also, when I read it, I thought, God, this is so researched, but it doesn't wear its research on its sleeve. You know, you read historical fiction and sometimes you're like, this doesn't need to be here. <laughs> the author just wants to show that they knew this, but it didn't serve the plot or the character in any way. And you you did that so deftly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I want to turn to a couple craft questions before we close, because there are a lot right. of questions about your, about your craft and your process. So... One question from John Baum is, how do you maintain momentum when working on your drafts? And what Anna Tretsky kind of similarly asks, what is the biggest inner obstacle that you face? Hmm. So um, I uh, believe it or not, I give myself a great deal of leeway. Um, and maybe I'm a little too soft, but I, I actually think that our work is it's very tender and needs to be coddled, especially in the beginning. So I don't judge it at all in any way. And I let it be really, 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 really bad in the first drafts. Um, and in fact, I try to do it as quickly as possible um, with, because I know that I'm not going to reread it. I'm going to like put it aside and rewrite it. So what that does is that allows me to just follow the ideas, follow the, the characters, develop the characters, um, come up with a structure, even if it's not the structure that I end up working through. It's it's like it's just play, right? And I think that the that's the number one thing that that closes me down and makes me feel unable is when I lose the sight that this is it should be joyous, it should be play, it should be fun, um, it should be like like. It, it do, fun doesn't mean not hard, right? As anyone who's gone on a fun, very difficult run knows, right? They're, they can exist at the same time, but um, it should be something that's engaging your whole self in as much as possible. And so I think often my fear is the thing that shuts me down and my, my anxiety and my, and my uh, desire for really tender new work to be mature work. Uh, which doesn't happen until much, much later in the process. Those are the things that shut me down. So the things that um, make me build momentum is knowing that my drafts are going to be very fast and very bad. And I'm not going to read them again. And that's totally fine. Or um, if I sit down, um, I will try to discover where the moment of great heat is in the book, in my conception of it. And I'll just write that. So you just go to the heat, you go to the power and, and to the passion and, and you, you go to the things in the first few drafts that matter most to you because that, that's the book talking back to you and telling you that it needs to be written like this and your ideas of it are wrong, <laughs> right? So um, I, think, I think always, especially in first drafts, knowing that it's, it's, it's supposed to be bad is really, really, really helpful. Absolutely. I echo everything yeah. you said. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say like 95% of any great novel is the revision of that first <laughs> inkling of the novel. So yeah, revision. Um, yeah. One last question before we, we wrap up. And this comes from Andrew Polk. He says, I read Florida for a creative writing class and I became enamored with your writing style. What writers would you say you're most influenced by 
and or who do you think uses their language in an equally artistic way? And, and you could just speak in general to, you know, who, who kind of has influenced you in your career and your path. Yeah, so many people, and I know I'm going to forget some really big ones, but just off the top of my head right now, I, um, Anne Carson is someone I go back to over and over and over again. Um, I read a great deal of poetry because I, it's really helpful and it's, um, it's wonderful and poets are so precise and they're so good at what they do. So um, Emily Dickinson, right, is, was the first poet that I fell in love with. Um, I think in terms of just like sheer music, uh, Shirley Hazard's The Transit of Venus was a book that just blew my mind. I uh, want to shout out uh, James Salter's uh, um, A Sport in a Pastime, I think might be his best book, even though Light Years gets a lot of uh, play, but I love his prose, even if I don't love the way that women are treated in his books. <laughs> I really, you know, I the King James Bible has the greatest rhythms of any book ever, right? If you want to, to go to rhythm, you go there. William Shakespeare, like if you want to read um, a sentence that always surprises you, you read a Shakespeare uh, play because he will go off on these monologues and they're, um, they, they be, the sentences begin in one place and then they like fracture and fragment and turn around and rip you in the face like they're the most amazing things so in terms of sheer um, joyous sentence level stuff like this is this these are some of the people let me think um let's see the uh, oh god uh, the tale of genji is a great book middle march is a great book um i just saw in my uh, stockholm hotel uh, beloved in swedish beloved is a great book like there are so many books that just fill you with vim right and and like joy and those are the things to, to hold dear when you're sitting down to do your own work too i think right absolutely sometimes i just have to sit down and read a few psalter sentences to get myself yeah. oh, that's right. I know. <laughs> and it's like, oh, oh. No, it's, it's, I think it's also good to have someone like Salter whose sentences you love so much and other things you don't like so much to write against too, a little bit, you know, that's also really good, but yeah. Like how it's beautiful, <laughs> but like sometimes what this beautiful language is saying is so awful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, I love this. I wish we thank could you. keep going. I just want to thank everyone, especially Barnes and Noble, uh, for hosting this wonderful live mm -hmm. event with Lauren Groff. I would want to remind everyone that uh, if you don't own a copy of Matrix, you can go to any of your local Barnes and Noble stores, purchase it, uh, and of course, bn.com is 24-7. Uh, you're going to want this, a first edition, I promise. <laughs> Also, please buy Jamie's books too. They're amazing. You will not be disappointed. She's genius. Thank you so much, Thank Lauren. You. Thank you to everyone for coming and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.